Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Laurie Williams. She's a distinguished university professor at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, USA. Laurie is one of the two first winners in 2009 of the ACM Six Soft Influential Educator Awards for her contributions to software engineering and computer science education. Laurie leads the Software Engineering Real Search Research Group at NC State, which I visited in 2014 15. Laurie is a co director of the NSA Science of Security Lablet at NC State. She was one of the founders of the first XP Azure Conference, XP Universe, in 2001 in Raleigh. Which, was, which has now grown into the Azure Annual Conference. She has published many papers in software engineering, software security, as well as advised many PhD students. She's also the lead author of the Pair Programming Illuminated book. Thank you very much for having accepted my invitation, Laurie. Uh, it's a long list, but it's also an incomplete list of all your your all the things you have done in your career would you like to add anything to this description of you and your career no thank you very much for that introduction and it's my pleasure to be here today okay thank you and we're going to start talking about software security you have been working with soft, software security for a few years and the question is can we trust most of the software we use every day? Yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest, no. <laughs> um, you know, as a security researcher, um, you know, we find software vulnerabilities really in anything we look at. Um, and I'm thankful that we don't have more big problems with security. Um, you know, we have plenty of problems with security, but I'm, I'm happy that it, it's not even worse because because there are vulnerabilities everywhere, unfortunately. Yes, yes, I know. And what are some of the biggest challenges that software developers face in this area? Well, I mean, I think the, the two basic fundamental problems that software developers face, one is... Um, they're not measured on producing secure software. They're measured on producing software. And so the security part, you know, can be, you know, just not prioritized in the in trying to get a product out the door. Um, and so, and sometimes management doesn't, doesn't really support slowing things down so that the product is more secure. So I think that that's the biggest, a, a big problem. Along with that is just like overwhelm. So, um, developers have lots of things that they're measured on, like making making software, but making it perform well and be accessible and be secure. There's a lot of things that the um, developers are all trying to do at the same time. Um, and then an, another thing is, and we're trying to work on this in education, is educating people so they know how to develop securely and really tr kind of transforming education so that um, students don't come in and learn how to develop software and then later develop secure software. So develop secure software from the beginning, that's just the way you do it. Um, but, you know, I, I think that developers have a lot of challenges right now um, from an education standpoint, a prioritization standpoint, from a pressure standpoint. Exactly, exactly. And how does your research and the research that you do with your PhD students and colleagues help software developers address those challenges? Yeah, so what we're trying to do with our work, I mean, there's a number of things that we're, we're working to do, um, but it is trying to make it easier. Like that's in the general case, trying to make it easier to develop secure software and um, to, to do it as efficiently as possible because there, there are, you know, it's a scarce resource, um, the attention that can be put on software security. And so how do you spend your time as efficiently and effectively as possible? Um, so 
some of the things that we we've done, like we we did a very large study on um, the efficiency and effectiveness of vulnerability detection tools. So like secure or self, or static analysis, dynamic analysis, penetration testing. Just looking at of those for the different types of vulnerabilities, what's the most efficient way to find that vulnerability? What's the most effective way to find a broad range of vulnerabilities? Um, so, so that's you know one aspect, but um, also like you know, coming up with metrics that use the use of the metrics can point people in the right direction for where to look in order to find vulnerabilities. Um, a lot of what we're doing now is focused on the software supply chain. Um, a lot of developers, aren't really all developers, get open source software and bring open source software into their projects. And um, attackers are now putting vulnerabilities intentionally into the open source software. Uh, and so, you know, how do you safely use open source software um, to not, you know, to not be a victim of, of what the attackers are doing and putting into the supply chain. So we're, we're coming at it from, from a lot of different angles. And, and uh, an additional question is, uh, you, you mentioned open source software, but there is also software like uh, those generated by GitHub Copilot or ChatGPT. Is that another concern that people will bring software vulnerabilities from those softwares yeah absolutely um, it's something that you know it's a new research area um, which is vulnerabilities because of chat gpt and other large language models um, and so it's it's a brand new thing that people are looking at um, there's really with, with sometimes with security there's intentional problems and then some unintentional problems and to you know say um, if I bring it back to supply chain, then I'll come back to the chat GPT. But with supply chain, um, people have used open source software for a long time. And sometimes developers by accident will put a vulnerability into some open source package. Like Log4j was a big one where like some developer made a mistake. And then attackers come along and take advantage of that mistake that the developers put in. Um, and then that causes the supply chain problem um, but that that was no one no malicious intent on the part of the developer similar with um, chat gpt and large language models they're being trained on what's going on and so copilot even a couple of years ago got um, some bad press because it was generating vulnerable code because that's what's out there so it's training on vulnerable code and then it generates vulnerable code um, and so that's something that, you know, we deal with, we'll deal with with ChatGPT as it's, and, you know, all of large language models as it's used to generate code, which it will be used to generate code. The other is intentionally the, you know, the training data being trained with injected vulnerable code. Um, and so, it, you know, and then, you know, the model will generate more code. So again, there's this, Unintentional, the fact that some, that, you know, what's out there and training data just happens to be vulnerable because that's what people are generating these days. And then also the unintentional or the intentional malicious um, training data that's put in. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of challenges in the forefront there. And what advice do you give to software engineers that want to create secure software? So the, the advice is, is to get educated as much as possible um, so that you can write code that's secure and abides by secure principles um, and you know, try to get yourself you know, to, to be engineering uh, secure code from the beginning. It's always harder, much harder to wait until the tools tell you that your code is insecure and then you fix it and you've been finished it for a long time and now you have to fix it. So it's much, much more efficient to design and architect secure projects from the beginning. Um, so, you know, the, the advice is really to be as educated as possible um, and to write from the beginning 
build with security in mind. And which which resources do you recommend to to those software engineers? I, I remember that w when I was at NC State, there was a visit by Gary McGraw. He had a book about that, but it it this was um, nine years ago. Right now, what can those software engineers do? Is there, a, for instance, I know there there is a, a journal. I three I triple we security, but are there any books, sites, what else? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, things change in security so fast, um, <clears throat> so it's hard to and and so books can hardly keep pace. I I really feel that the U.S. government and NIST and um, a lot of the government agencies are actually putting out really good things, um, you know. Uh, so I guess when I when I think about where do I look, I look for NIST, the U.S. Um, National Institute for Standards and Technology, and what they put out. Um, OWASP is a um, is a nonprofit organization that puts out great resources. Um, the Cloud Native Foundation puts out a lot of good resources. Um, the Linux Foundation, um, OpenSSF, which is Open Secure Software Framework, maybe, I'm not sure. OpenSSF puts out a lot of good resources. And the reason that all of those things I find are good resources are because it's not one person coming up with it. Everything goes out for public comment and, you know, it's consensus based and they do tend to update over time. So, and you know, there's, there's a lot, there are a lot of good things. So like in my class, I teach a software security class um, and every year it's different because everything changes every year, but those are the, the my go-to places to go look for, what am I going to teach this year? Um, the, those particular sites. Very good. And now we are going to mm -hmm. talk about Azure software development. You co-wrote a book on pair programming and you have also written many papers related to Azure software development. In fact, if you go to your Google Scholar profile, nine out of your 10 most cited works there are related to Azure. How did you get interested in Azure software development? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, there, there's two things I'll say. One is I worked for IBM before I went back to get my PhD. And this was a bit ago, like, you know, it was, I guess, in the um, early 90s, so quite a long time ago. And so I'm going to make some statements about IBM, which are, which are sure not true now. But at the time, back in the early 90s, um, the software process at IBM, as in many places, was very heavy weight, very waterfallish, very step by step. Um, and... Like it, it was just didn't work, which is why Agile came about in the first place. But I had firsthand knowledge. I like experienced it in my workplace. So when Agile came along, when I was a PhD student, it was very appealing to me right away because I had lived the problems that Agile was addressing. So it was, it was very, you know, very appealing to me for that. Um, and then also I happened to be a PhD student looking for a PhD topic at the right time. Um, and in that particular case, Alistair Coburn, who was one of the Agile Manifesto signers, was someone when I was in uh, University of Utah in Salt Lake City, he was there and you know I, I met with him. And so he was the one who brought up this. There wasn't even the name Agile at that point. It was even before that. Um, and, you know, he, he came in and was talking about um, this new thing, extreme programming. And my advisor got excited about it because he had been working with Hewlett Packard. So just like the excitement, something brand new um, sent me down that path. And it worked for me, you know, even after all these years, you're saying nine out of the top 10 are from, from those days. And your, your PhD was about pair programming, right? Right. Yeah, my PhD was about pair programming, and again, um, you know, it's again my my excitement and my I would say with pair programming specifically, it was more my advisor's excitement. Um, he he 
in his lifetime had done a lot of pair programming. And when he heard about pair programming, he was like, I've done that. And so um, when you're a PhD student looking for a topic, you're looking for the twinkle in your advisor's eye. Um, and then you go after that topic. So that's how that happened. And again, it worked for me. Great, great. And now, uh, just before a little bit of context, I, I have a podcast in Portuguese, which is only about women in computer science. And we always ask this question because um, people, women, they, they uh, at least uh, I believe in the US too, but in Brazil, it's a, a, a small minority of professionals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we asked that because we were curious about, you want to know, how did you get interested in computer science? How was your education in the area? Because I, I, as far as I know, you don't have a, a bachelor's degree in computer science, right? Right, yeah. So my bachelor's degree is in industrial engineering. Um, and you know, as I was heading towards school and, and finishing high school, I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. And, and I was pretty stubborn about that. And then every year, my guidance counselor, that's what we had in the US, um, who would give you advice on what to do, was always saying, you're good in engineering, because my test results said that. And my father was an engineer, and he wanted me to do it. And I was like, nope, kindergarten teacher. But the very last year of high school, I was like, fine, I'll just do engineering. And so I did that. Um, and so I got an engineering degree and then went to work for IBM as an engineer, um, which was good. I liked it. You know, I didn't, I didn't regret being a kindergarten teacher. I was happy with what I was doing. But in, at IBM, they asked me to be the assistant to the lab director. Um, and, and so in that job, you know, being that, you know, with him all the time, um, he had software people and hardware people, manufacturing people. He had a variety of types of people in his organization, and one of them, you know, being software. And after my assignment being his assistant, then um, he said, what do you want to do next? And so I said, software, I think that would be good. And so then I did that, and it was interesting. And then when I left IBM and I knew I wanted to get a PhD at that point, I knew I liked industrial engineering and I knew I liked computer science. And then I was like, what should I do? And it just seemed like computer science was more versatile, more flexible, probably more opportunities. And so I chose, chose computer science at that point. And it did, you know, it is flexible and probably, you know, greater number of computer scientists. So. And this is also related to a question that uh, uh, I ask in my other podcast. And mm -hmm. the, I have to say that the answers sometimes surprise me because as a man, I don't face the, the difficulties that the women face. Did mm -hmm. you face difficulties at school or at work that you feel they, they were because you are a woman? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think not as much in high school. Like, so when I was coming up, like sometimes people, even as young as say 10, 11, 12, like girls along those lines start to get pushed in different directions. I didn't actually face that. Um, I, I really think that the first place in my career or life when I faced problems from being a woman was in my PhD. So not at IBM, you know, all the way till I got my PhD. And um, at the time, as I got my PhD, in the four years it took me to get a PhD, which I did it pretty quick, um, there were only two women. In four years worth of class of PhD students, it was only two women. Um, and that was hard and it was hard. I was also had three children too. So that, that was made me different than the other students because you, generally it was males without children and I was a female with three children. Um, and it was hard. Um, I think if I didn't have as much like determination that I'm getting this degree, no matter what you throw at me, I might not have done it. Um, 
I would, you know, I had a lot of things against me, not just being a woman, but I was an industrial engineer where everyone else was computer scientists. Um, I had children and they didn't. I was one of the few women. Um, so I, I had a lot of a lot of things that made it harder. Um, and I tried to give the faculty members who were basically all male the benefit of the doubt um, because I thought they just know how to work with men. They don't know how to work with women. Like they aren't trying to do anything against me. They just don't know what to do with me. Um, and the other thing is like a, a lesson that I learned is that it felt really hard for me when I did it. And it felt like people were working against me, but 17 years after I graduated, they invited me back to do a presentation and everyone was so happy to see me. And so it made me think maybe it was just the pressure I was under that made me feel like they were working against me and they weren't at all. And so it's just a good reminder that like it's our own interpretation of things. Sometimes it's not reality. It's just the interpretation. Um, so. And do you participate, do you take part in any support groups for women in computing? I have participated in support groups and like I'll, I'll take advantage of anything like at conferences, I might have a women's thing and I'll, I'll go um, and support women in every day, every day that I can, that I do. Um, you know, something that I did um, back in my department was I was the um, department head, the interim department head at a time. And I felt like the only reason that I did that, because I really like research, the only reason I really agreed to do that was to be an example to women. So like there's times where I just do something just, just to be an example. And like in, in that particular case, like there's this wall of all the department heads from the very beginning, we've had, I think our department is now 55 years old. So the, all the department heads from the last 55 years are all on the wall and they were all white men all the way down the hall. And um, then when my picture got put up there, I thought my work is done here. Now women can walk down the hall and know you could be a woman and do this too. So I, I guess I have that mentality and with a lot of things I do is just um, to be there for women when I can and to be a role model in, in all ways that I can. And what would you, would you say to girls or women that want to follow a career in computing that might be listening to this podcast? Yeah, well, I mean, take, take what I um, said earlier that even if it's hard for you to not, to try to like not not take it personally, um, that to just keep trying to do your best and get with other women. You know, when I was teaching classes that had groups, and I still do, I always try to make sure that if there's one woman in a group, there's two, you know, and, and just support each other as much as you possibly can, can throughout the process, um, you know, really to carry, so we carry each other through the process. Um, and if you get any, if you're feeling like you're getting any messages to say like women aren't as good at this or anything, just like forget it. Don't even pay attention to it. Don't take it personally. Just keep doing your best and the right things will happen. Great. And now I, I'm going to talk about uh, another topic, which is advising and mentoring. And uh, as, as I read told, Listeners here, I have spent one year at your group, and at one curious thing about that is that all those PhD students that are now PhD people, they, they, they are professionals, about half of those people are in industry, half in academia. So mm -hmm. you have advised at least 20 PhDs, and mm -hmm. some of whom work in the industry, Microsoft, SAS, IBM, Google, some in academia. Did you serve as a mentor for them in deciding what to do after graduation? Um, so my advice to them always was to be as flexible as possible throughout. Like, um, 
I've had some that came in like I'm going to industry and they're in academia now and vice versa. Um, and so like I really my my advice to them was like, don't make a decision, just do a good job, publish your papers and even go through the um, interview process with both industry and academia because you don't know. I, I feel like that when it comes to getting your first job after a PhD and maybe just getting your first job, when you go to the interview, you know, like, this is where I'm supposed to be, or this is not where I'm supposed to be. I mean, and, and um, what I tell the students is like, apply lots of places and let the universe decide, like, let, let the world, like, let, let life show you where you're supposed to be. So if you decide yourself as you as a person, like I'm going to go to academia, you're you don't know, you know, so but then if it turns out you apply to industry and and academia and no one from industry interviews you, then life has told you the right path for you is academia. Like and then you can't question, you can't ever say, I wonder what would have happened if I had applied to Google or I wonder what like, you know, what would have happened because you did it. And then you can feel more confident with your choice. And so really my advice to them always was just, you know, keep your options open, which, which can mean like some people can say, I'm just going to go to industry and they might not focus as much on writing on publications because of that. But then, then they have decided for themselves. And so rather that be flexible and keep your options open. Great. So you are an important figure in the world of software engineering. Many people know you. For instance, uh, I have interviewed in one of my podcasts, uh, Guilherme Travassos, and I mentioned you and he, he oh, Laurie, Laurie, I know Laurie. And mm -hmm. oh, by, by the way, we are going to have ICSI 2000, I believe 2024. Oh, I'm not sure, but oh, I, yeah. I'll put in the description. It's it's either yeah. 24 or 25, but um, no, I mean, so FSC is sooner, maybe 2026 in, in Brazil. Yeah, or 25, maybe. But anyway, yes, but I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's 2026 XC 2025 FSC. Yes, maybe or you you will come because you you usually attend those big mm -hmm. software yeah, engineering yeah. events mm -hmm. in Rio de Janeiro. And, mm -hmm. and, but the question is for you, what's the next frontier in software engineering? It can be something that you think will happen or something that you'd like to see happening in our field. Yeah. I mean, so I guess from a software engineering standpoint, I mean, and, and I'm doing a talk at ICSI this year is really, I mean, I'm, I think that software should be secure and that you can't say the security people will do that, that we could all consider ourselves security people. So if you're in requirements or testing or whatnot, like everyone should consider security as part. And that's what I would love for software engineering is just like, we all do it. Exactly. And I, I just confirmed it's 2026. It's going okay. to exit okay. to 2026. It's going to be in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, for the first time in, in Brazil, but not the first time in Latin America, because I remember there was a, a, an ICSI on Buenos Aires, Argentina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks again for your time, Laurie. Would like to leave some final words for our audience? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I guess, you know, some of the things are, you know, when I think about some of the best advice that I've gotten, um, there, there was one woman that I was my manager at IBM and I was a new, you know, just out of college and, you know, trying to navigate the world of being a professional. And at the time, and maybe still today, there was a lot of pressure because I was women were a minority to act like a man. And I, you know, thought I needed to do that. And I was doing that as best I could, but it wasn't natural. And she said, 
you know, you're here too many hours of the day, just be yourself. And that was great advice because then I could relax. And actually, you know, I feel like I was just as successful as I would have been if I acted like a man. Um, and so my advice is like, just be yourself, do a good job. And, you know, everything that, that is supposed to happen should happen. It's much more comfortable to be yourself. Yes, great advice. So thank you very much, everyone. See you in the next episode of our podcast. Thank you very much.